Hi, so we are continuing with applications of Gauss's law and in this video, instead of the spherical symmetry, we'll look at cylindrically symmetric cases. And cylindrical symmetry is a bit difficult to describe as just rotational symmetry in 3D. So let me draw the figure and highlight some of the symmetries that we can observe. So here's my cylinder. It has a circular cross-section, and even though it looks like I'm drawing it finitely, really what you should understand is that this is an infinitely long cylinder. It continues on without limit. I was really only drawing those circles as an indication of the cross-section. So with a cylinder like this, we have two clear symmetry operations we can do. One is rotation. But unlike with the sphere, I have only one axis of rotational symmetry. I can rotate this cylinder around this axis and nothing will change. So that's one. And we gain a new type of symmetry with a cylindrical geometry here. As long as we have an infinitely long cylinder, we have what's called translational symmetry. That means we can take the cylinder, and if we translate it, we don't change anything. Now, for a finite cylinder, you can see that it's clearly not true. You translate it, you have moved it, you have changed the things. But with an infinitely long cylinder, when you move it a little bit up or down, you haven't changed anything because it still goes on forever. So those are the two symmetries we are going to exploit to help us use Gauss's law to solve for electric field in this setup. So we have the same question as before. What is the electric field, both outside and inside the sphere? Let me give the sphere a radius of R, capital R. All right, let's do the easy part first. Let's say we want to know the electric field at this point here where the distance r, lowercase r, is greater than the radius of the cylinder. Then our first job is to find the closed surface that honors the symmetry of the system. So I have cylindrical symmetry, so I should pick a cylindrical surface. Now, here's a bit of a wrinkle in the plan. We can't have this Gaussian surface be an infinitely long cylinder because then it won't be a closed surface. The one part of using Gauss's law you have to remember is that it only applies to a closed surface. So you have to close up the surface somehow so that we can actually use Gauss's law. And the way to do it is to actually close it up with these end caps that I drew here. So instead of this being just an indicator of the cross-sectional area, I just say, well, that is my actual closing surface, top and bottom. And the side surfaces close up the rest. So I have a cylindrical, finitely long closed surface. So this is where it's useful to draw electric field lines. When you look at this uh, long line of charge, really the only kind of electric field line that makes sense is this one. The electric fields are going in the radial direction away from the cylinder. And if you want, we can go through the same argument proof by contradiction as before to show that an electric field that looks like this is impossible you assume this impossible case, then what you can argue through is, well, I have that reflection operation as a symmetry operation. So you do reflection, nothing in the charge changes, but the electric field has to go from uh, pointing up to pointing downward. That's absurd, so that's contradictory. So that means our initial assumption was wrong, electric field can't be pointing up or down. It has to only point radially outward. Now, this gives us an interesting possibility. 
even though we had to close up this top and the bottom surface to be able to say we have closed the surface. Looking at this electric field line here, we can see that it's going to work out so that the electric flux through the top surface is zero. None of the field lines go through it. And the electric flux through the bottom surface is also zero. So really the only thing we need to worry about is what is the flux through the side surface. So let's work through that. This is what left-hand side in Gauss's law says. And from the argument that we just went through, we can say that this is no longer integral over closed the surface, but integral over just the side the surface. Now, along the side the surface, this is what we can argue. We can argue that the electric field magnitude is uniform over the whole side the surface. We can see that from translational symmetry that the electric field magnitude here should be equal to the electric field magnitude there. Otherwise, you don't have translational symmetry. And from the rotational symmetry, the electric field at one point there, electric field at another point here, electric field here, here, they are all going to have the same magnitude also. And like with the sphere, we have a happy coincidence that here the area element is directed in the same direction as the electric field. And just to reiterate, the area element at the top and the bottom surface are perpendicular to the electric field and contribute zero contribution to the flux. All right, I think that means here we can get rid of this dot product, say that we are just dealing with the magnitude of the electric field times the area element for the side surface. We just made the argument that the electric field is uniform over the surface, so we can pull it out of the integral. So the only thing we are left with is integral over the side surface of the cylinder. Well, I have the circumference, which should be 2 pi r, uh, lowercase r, because we are looking at the Gaussian surface, times the, oh, I guess I have to give it some parameter, times some height, h. So this is the left-hand side. Electric field times 2 pi r, H is the net flux out of this cylindrical Gaussian surface. Now let's look at the right hand side. So for the right hand side, we are looking at charge and closed times a bunch of constants. Now for this charge and closed, it can't be the charge of the entire wire because then wire being infinite, it's going to be infinite amount of charge. We really only mean the amount of charge enclosed within the Gaussian surface we defined. So we need to figure that out. Ah, so here we would need some kind of a density. We could do the same thing we did with the uniformly charged sphere. We can say for the uniformly charged cylinder that it has a uniform charge density rho zero then I think I can express the amount of charge enclosed in terms of this density and the volume, which should be the area of the cross-section, pi r squared times, this is where this parameter came useful, height. All right, let's look at what we get. So I'm going to solve this expression for electric field, plugging in charge enclosed as I go. So the electric field is equal to a whole bunch of constants divided by the factors from the left-hand side, 2 pi r h. Ooh, this h cancels. That's good because it was an arbitrary height that shouldn't have any physical meaning. So I was hoping that it would cancel out, and it does. So we have uh, this as a result. Electric field outside a cylinder is equal to a bunch of constants times 1 over r. And this is what I want you to notice, that with an infinitely long cylinder, 
the distance dependence of the electric field magnitude goes as 1 over r, not 1 over r squared. And we can do a little more simplification. Let me do that for the version I'm going to write down here. Now, we actually derived all this using integration over the charge distribution. So what's really going to be new here is the exact same situation we looked at for the sphere. What would be the electric field, for example, for a point inside the cylinder? So we are looking at where radius of the Gaussian surface will be less than the radius of the charge. So this is the Gaussian surface that contains that point. All right, let's step through each step in the calculation and see what we need to change. The left-hand side, the starting point never changes. And it looks like we are still keeping the top and bottom surface, the flux through those to be zero. So this uh, closed surface area integral is really this open surface integral. And the exact same argument we made for the symmetry of electric field still applies inside the cylinder. So this step is still valid. Um, the surface area of the side surface of cylinder, that's not going to change. Hmm. So it looks like what will have changed is exactly the same thing we are dealing with for the spherical case we have to work out the enclosed charge again. So with the radius of the Gaussian surface less than the radius of the charge distribution, what we need to say is that charge distribution, we are not looking at the cylinder of radius capital R. We are really looking at the radius of lowercase r. So let me write that down. All right, plug in for Q enclosed. So that changes this, this capital R squared into lowercase r squared. Oh, I think that means there's a cancellation. This factor of 1 over r that we had before, it cancels out with the 1 factor of r. And this is the answer that we are left with. So the electric field is a bunch of constants times r for the for the distance from the axis of the cylinder less than the radius of the cylinder. So there's an interesting coincidence between what happens for the electric field inside the charge distribution. And we seem to be getting very similar results for the sphere and the cylinder. And I hope that makes intuitive sense. Because if you're along the axis of the cylinder, then your electric field would be zero due to symmetry. All right, that's everything I had for this geometry. Uh, in the next video, we'll look at last of the three symmetrical geometries where we can use Gauss's law, and that'll be the planar geometry. Until then, bye.